Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Cryptozoology. Today, I want to draw to your attention a really interesting photograph that I found recently. And it's interesting because it actually really helps to showcase not only an interesting and very perplexing argument for the case that it brings up, but it also showcases a really good characteristic to look for when examining cryptozoological evidence, especially in the form of the visual medium, like photographs, eyewitness sketches, things like that. I think it's a case that really deserves more looking into, and I hope all of you find it at least interesting. Today, I want to talk to you about the Gillies Loch Ness photograph, which cannot really be found on many places uh, on the internet. It's not a very popular photograph or anything, although I really wish it was, because it is certainly very interesting. The best place to find it is on the video that I originated from on the photographer's YouTube channel, which I will link in the description if you'd like to take a look at that. The photograph itself is part of a series of photographs that was taken while fish were swimming by an underwater camera in Loch Ness, and the photographer, John Gillies, believes in 2003, during one such series of photographs, that he captured an image of what he calls the head of the Loch Ness Monster, or I should say one of the Loch Ness Monsters, coming into frame behind the swarm of fish. What's also interesting about that, other than the fact that it may suggest behavioral characteristics if this is a real animal that we're dealing with, is that it relates to a series of photographs from the 70s, one in particular, but really also two in particular, that sort of help to validate the ideas behind this photograph. Before I show you the Gillies 2003 head photograph, I will actually go over the 70s photographs that I'm talking about so that you can all get a better idea of what we could be dealing with here. The 70s photographs were part of expeditions conducted by Robert Rhines. Robert Rhines was a scholar. He helped found the Franklin Pierce Law School in New Hampshire. He actually helped develop sonar when he was uh, serving in World War II. And he spent most of his time in Scotland because he had a fascination with the Loch Ness Monster phenomenon. If any of you have watched my History of Sea Monster Carcasses video, you will know that Rhines actually had his own sighting. He described seeing a hump with what he said had elephant-like skin that sort of drifted around the loch in a circle manner, so it, it seemed conscious of what it was doing. Of course, that can be explained by other factors. And then it plopped back down, and that was sort of the end of his sighting. It was a life-changing experience for him, and he basically dedicated the rest of his life to figuring out what the bottom of that could be. He constantly went out on expeditions to the lock with colleagues of his, and he found some very interesting evidence. He took very compelling photographs, although not all of them turned out to be what he thought they would be. Uh, of course, none of them have been proven to be the Loch Ness Monsters, because if they were, we wouldn't be talking about it right now. What I mean is that a few of his photographs had been disproven. Ryan's also had what he called the gargoyle head photograph, which he believed was a monster rearing its head towards the camera underwater, which turned out to be a rock that you can actually still locate in the loch currently. But two of his photographs that haven't been really disproven are his flipper photographs and his head and neck photographs which I believe were both taken in the 70s. I know the head and neck photograph was taken during 75. What is interesting about the flipper photograph is, while it has received some controversy, it was his first set of photographs, and it was taken while there was a swarm of fish swimming through the lock. And he took the photographs there because he figured maybe something's following it. And lo and behold, it seems like something was. Whether it was a Loch Ness Monster or not is obviously still debated. And ironically, Gilly's photograph, which again I will show you at the end of this explanation, was taken under very similar circumstances. Could that suggest behavioral patterns if this is an animal? Yes, it could. But that's going under the assumption that it's an animal, and we don't want to assume anything here. What is more significant to the Gilly's photograph is the head and neck photograph from 75, which I will show on screen now. And the first thing that will strike you is this thing looks like a Loch Ness Monster. That's pretty hard to debate. We're going to look at it under the lens of, well, let's assume this is some kind of independent object here. What could it be? So the first thing you're going to want to note is the position of this object, which has been very debated. The case seems to be, as you can see off to the side here, this is the light mounted with the camera that Ryan's used for his photographs. He had a strobe light system where a motion sensor would pick up if anything moved past the camera, and if it did, a strobe light would begin to go off in the water. And as it went off, a camera would take a picture every time the light went off. 
and so he captured this image at one point. Again, the light source seems to reflect fairly well onto the object. There is a point of interest right at near the top of the object where there's shadowed an area. That could be because there's a layer of depth there that we're not seeing on the object. It could be because the quote-unquote head of the object is a bit wider than we think it is, and so it casts a shadow on its own neck, or what seems to be its own neck. That's a little bit hard to explain. But it is there nonetheless, and the light seems to line up correctly with it. So looking at this object, independent of the light source, you see a very defined and definite shape. Of course, towards the back, where the water becomes darker due to no light, you can't really see what's back there, but you can see the front fairly well. You can see the main body, you could say, perhaps the best, a fairly bulky body. There appear to be fins, or flippers, on the sides, which are very interesting, and actually, looking at it a certain way, it bears a striking resemblance to Ryan's flipper photographs. Coming up from that, it sort of slenders out into this long protrusion, which Ryan's believed was the neck of the animal. And the neck is craned very slightly, which is interesting, because most of the eyewitness reports say that the Loch Ness monsters are able to do a swan position of some sort, which does not seem to be the case here, but of course that's assuming that this is an animal, not an object. But there is a craning of this neck area nonetheless. There is a curve. And the curve veers off into what does look like a head. And what I mean by that is there are certain features on the head that are definable that aren't really definable in other areas of the body. There is, for instance, what appears to be an underbite, and this is going to actually become extremely important as we talk about the Gillies photograph. There appears to be an underbite, a defined line that appears to be the mouth of the animal. There's a rounded off snout at the top, and there could be an eye ridge and even an eye present, although that's a bit hard to discern from the quality of the photograph. Another thing to note that will become very important is the snout and the lower jaw, or at least what we're calling the snout and lower jaw, seem to be a bit brighter in color than the rest of the head. Now, that being said, as we look at it under the lens of, well, is it an animal, we also should look at it under the lens of, well, is it just an inanimate object? The best explanations that I have heard thus far are that this is a log floating to the top of the lock, as they sometimes do due to currents and different pressures and things like that, and then it never reaches the top and it simply sinks back down again, as to why Ryan's never observed this log floating to the surface where he was stationed, which is entirely possible. Jumping ahead quite a few years, we come to finally the Gillies photograph from 2003. I will play the video in its entirety real quick, I might even speed it up a bit just because the slideshow is a bit slow. Um, but I will stop on the final photograph, which is that of the alleged Loch Ness Monster head that comes into frame. So, in the first few images, or at least in the second image, I believe, you can clearly see fish swimming by the camera. And then we come to this photograph. This is allegedly the Loch Ness Monster head coming into frame following the fish. Now, there's a few factors that we need to take into consideration with this photograph before we compare it to the 75 photograph, which I'm sure a lot of you are already doing mentally. For one thing, the object definitely seems closer to the camera than farther, and the reason I say that is because visibility in Loch Ness is not very good. It doesn't exceed 20 meters, so it's not that far, and of course the camera, you can see the light is coming from the camera, and maybe a bit from the sun, depending on how shallow the waters are in that area. An analysis of the photograph shows that there is some light coming onto this head object from above rather than below it where the camera seems to be. So what can be said about the Gillies photograph? Well, it's hard to tell what this object is. We see a bluish gray coloration. We see what appears to be a snout-like object. We might even be seeing nostrils right there. And we definitely see a mouth-like line. We don't see the rest of the body, so who knows what that looks like. I have not been able to find many candidates that fit the look of this object. The closest I could find is some kind of species of conger eel, which are common in the United Kingdom, and have these lip-like protrusions on their mouth, and they're fairly bulky creatures as well. And they have these lip-like protrusions, which may be what we're seeing instead of these nostril-like holes, that could be the line formed by the lip-like protrusion, which is possible. What would be confusing about that, unless some kind of strange motion blur is involved, which again may be possible, is the conger eel, while it's a bulky animal, the snout of the conger eel does not really look like that. You couldn't really even call it a snout. 
it almost forms a point. You don't really see that here. So what this object is, I'm not sure. What I think can be fairly said is that there are striking resemblances between the Gilly's head and the Rhine's head. So if we have the two on screen here right now, you notice a few things pretty instantly. The general shape is nearly the same. And you have the same sort of rounded off top snout. And you have the very straight line that forms what may be the mouth. And you even have bright spots just about where they should be. There's definitely a bright spot in the Gillies photograph. The Ryan's one could be due to lighting, but it is interesting to note that there's bright spots on the same spot in both photographs. What is perhaps the most interesting bit of this, though, is that both the Rhine's subject and the Gillies subject not only share the same shape, not just share a mouth line and this and that, a slender beak-like protrusion, they share the underbite. And that's very important, and, the, and it showcases the reason why the Gillies photograph is perhaps one of the most important photographs in cryptozoology at least one of the most underrated currently. In the visual medium for cryptozoology, continuity, physical continuity, is of the utmost importance. And let me explain it to you because that might be a bit hard to grasp. It was for me. What I mean is that when you're dealing with a field like cryptozoology in which you are dealing with claims that there is an unidentified organism in a specific area of the world, the first thing you're going to want to say is, okay, well, what does it look like? Now, if you have, you have two mediums that can be presented through, and that's photography and eyewitness claims. Well, first off, photography and eyewitness claims, although they're in the same visual medium, cannot quite be equated. And the reason for that is because what you're looking for is the continuity of appearance spread over a considerable amount of time throughout a considerable portion of the population that claims to have seen or photographed the subject. And when you have eyewitness claims where everyone claims different things about the animal, that they look entirely different from each other, you have something that seems to be more of a psychological phenomenon than a physical one, because animals do not change their physical makeup incredibly drastically in a short amount of time. They're physical beings, obviously. Now, if you have eyewitnesses that are describing the same thing over a generous amount of time throughout a generous portion of the population, that's better, but it's not as good as photographs doing that because it can still be a psychological phenomenon. Again, that is not to say that this is a psychological or physical phenomenon one way or the other. I'm simply saying that it definitely does not lend as much credibility to a physical phenomenon as a psychological one, although it does lend some to both. The reason photographs are better in this medium is because it suggests to a great deal that there is at the very least an object in that area where people are claiming there is an unidentified organism that has been there for a considerable amount of time and has not changed in appearance over that amount of time. And what that suggests is, okay, well, there's at least an object associated with this. And because the subject that is this is unidentified organisms, the object that we're photographing may be an unidentified organism because it resembles itself throughout history. If it does not resemble itself throughout history, it seems more likely to be a psychological phenomenon. When you have a case like the Rhines photograph from 1975 being so incredibly similar to a photograph from 2003, you have something there that suggests continuity. And what continuity suggests, in turn, is that there is a physical phenomenon taking place. Ultimately, this is the reason I think that the Gillies photograph is so important and really should get more recognition. I've tried to get a hold of John Gillies, who took the photograph. I have not heard back from him yet, and I hope to very soon. Maybe even have him for a talk on the channel about his photograph and his other findings. Let me know what you all think about this photograph and this comparison in the comments. I'd really like to hear your opinions on the continuity of photographs and the continuity of physical evidence, or at least suggested physical evidence. Before I go, I would also like to note the channel recently hit 100 subscribers, and for that, I'd actually like to have a live stream where everyone could kind of come on and we can all sort of discuss our opinions on things. 
and I'll be able to address questions and address my opinions on things and be able to actually discuss and debate with people, which I think will be very interesting and is a good opportunity. That being said, until next time.